Assalamu alaikum. What's the response? Who knows the response? Assalamu alaikum. Hmm? That's, we'll take it. <laughs> That's about right. Assalamu alaikum. The response is, Walaikum salam. So may the peace of God be with you and also with you, more or less. Um, we adopt the empathetic voice uh, in, in history so that we can face the challenge to get inside the heads of the people we are trying to understand. This is the core of the struggle of a lot of what we do uh, in education and in life. We try to figure out what's going on inside of other people's heads. That is the key to so many things. Wouldn't it be great if empathy were more fundamental to every breath we take? It would solve a whole lot of problems uh, in that one fell swoop. In considering uh, my prior configuration of the course, I realized that we have had a great run of looking at uh, a section of, of, uh, of centuries, sometimes one century, sometimes concentrated in the Cold War period, uh, post-war, so sometimes very focused on a period but looking at multiple locations and multiple approaches and multiple attitudes within a single lecture. And okay, we've done that quite a bit. And we've covered uh, world religions, different manifestations of world religions. But now let's kind of dig a little deeper. Let's do the world religions that at this moment in history that we're getting into, this era, is so fundamentally and profoundly transformed by the proliferation of these civilizations, these systems of thought and belief that are so powerful at organizing so many people's lives and so many, civil so many cities and so many societies. And so we start, so we're going to, this is the first of uh, four lectures where we're going to look at at least four, so far four, where we organize the lecture according to a system of thought, a world religion. We start with the most modern of the four great religions that we'll be studying uh, because it's the most recent and because, arguably, it has the most modern attitude. And we'll be looking at the evidence for and against that. And it cuts against the grain of popular conventional wisdom, which, surprise, surprise, isn't always very wise. Um, and so... Uh, we're starting with Islam, four sites of Islam, as you see on the handout, uh, if you have a handout, and um, I think there's some more here. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, here we go. And I want to start with, uh, okay, so you can have this one. I didn't print enough, okay. So we're going to look at four sites, uh, but we're going to start with um, something that I just love about Islam. And I, I personally um, was raised Catholic. Uh, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. I converted to uh, a Protestant religion, and then I explored all kinds of other stuff. And somewhere along the, all the way, I lived for five years uh, in... Uh, Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country in the world. And the first night I was woken, um, startled by this sound. And this is the Azan call to prayer. And I had never heard anything like it. And it was something like two in the morning. And what the heck is that? What is going on? And this is not the recording I wanted to play for you because it wasn't like this. This is one asan with one call to prayer 
with this heavy reverb. Uh, but the way I experienced it was I heard something way off in the distance like this, something remotely resembling this. And the echo was because it was echoing through the city. And then I heard another one closer start up. And then a minute into it, one right on top of me launched in. And it was deafening. Uh, and it was two in the morning. And this is the way it goes. The mosques all over the city were were exploding in this sound. And it was something that woke me up the second night also. By the third night, it was just normal. And five times a day, the call to prayer uh, punctuates life of the city. And sometimes the people you're with push pause and they go off. They find a local prayer hall that's around the corner. Or in the building itself, office buildings would have prayer halls called Mushola, uh, but some wouldn't. And it was, at least in the version of Islamic society that I experienced uh, in Indonesia, it was just kind of casual, normal, uh, it wasn't enforced, um, headscarves, women could wear headscarves or not, it was a matter of personal choice. So it was a very, very interesting um, experience for me, I wish, you know, and there's something about this overlapping echo that evokes for me the form of the mukarnas. Remember the mukarnas, hanging, hanging arch, stalactite, uh, squinches and vaults uh, that we saw in Samarkand and we saw it in Isfahan. Um, so here we go. Um, starting off from our home base, we uh, are going off to Jerusalem, a place I didn't think we were going to be visiting, um, but it turns out we are. Um, so a site that um, I'm glad we can fit in, going over North Africa, and we're looking at the, the Arabian Peninsula, something we know now as Saudi Arabia. The Arabian Peninsula is the birthplace of Islam, a 40-year-old uh, merchant orphan um, in the city of Mecca, uh, had, was visited by the Archangel Gabriel in a dream. And this he developed this very strong relationship with Gabriel. And over the course of several years, the revelation of God uh, came to the world, to mankind, through Muhammad, this 40-year-old merchant. And the city of Mecca at the time was filled with idol worshippers and idols, and he had a tough time negotiating uh, with the city fathers to uh, make a place, a primary place, for his revelation of God's will. And by the way, um, Muhammad was very clear. This is the same God as, as in Judaism, the same God as in Christianity. This was simply God correcting the centuries of uh, watered down and misinterpretation of God's word. And so uh, Islam shares with Judaism and Christianity the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, Jesus is a prophet, a very important prophet in the Muslim worldview. Uh, and the instead of memorizing all the dates of uh, Muhammad's birth, death, uh, when he went to war and finally conquered Mecca and drove out the idol worship uh, practices of Mecca. Uh, we focus uh, for this lecture, because of the architecture, on the date 621. The year 621 is when uh, a particularly memorable uh, session um, Muhammad liked to go up into a cave and commune in isolation with the Archangel Gabriel. And this particularly memorable occasion was when uh, Gabriel, or Jibril in, uh, in Islamic, uh, in the Quran, said, we're going on a trip. And so they went off to um, Mount Zion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And from there, 
Gabriel and Muhammad entered the seven heavens, and along the way they met all of the prophets of uh, the people of the book, which is the reference to those who follow the primary texts of the Old and New Testament uh, and the Quran, people of the book. They share in common Abraham. This is the site where Abraham was commanded, was directed to bring his son uh, and a knife and slaughter his son uh, as if he were a sheep to prove his devotion to God. Uh, at the last second, uh, his hand is stayed and he spares the life of his son. But this is the Temple Mount, also the site of the first temple uh, of Solomon, uh, the home of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the, uh, the carrying the chamber which holds the original uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments. Very important document there. And so this site, and I'm claiming in this lecture that this is the most contested site in human history to the present day, a hot spot, and it has never not been a hot spot. Uh, and so uh, here we go to the Dome of the Rock Church. I direct your attention uh, over here. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And in that church, that church is built on top of the location of the tomb in which Jesus was laid, and it's adjacent to the location of Golgotha, the mount, the hill top, where Jesus was crucified uh, with the two um, criminals on either side. And so this is the spatial configuration of this location, and this is where uh, Gabriel takes Muhammad in his dream up to the seven heavens, and this the importance of this is that it's during this session that Allah uh, commands Muhammad to pray 50 times a day. And so Muhammad says, okay, goes down, and then Moses says, hey, 50 times, that's a little rough. You better go make a better deal. And so he takes multiple trips, and eventually... He reduces it to five times a day. So when you when we're praying five times a day and we're saying, oh my God, i got to get up at two in the morning to pray again, hey, don't complain. It was, it was almost 50 times a day, so just get over it. Five times you've got to break. Each time you pray, it counts ten times. Um, that's how beneficent, 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 and generous God is. Um, and so it gives us prayer. One of the five pillars of Islam is Salat, the, uh, the obligation to face Mecca and pray. It didn't start out as facing Mecca. It started out as facing the Dome of the Rock. And so uh, in Mecca, where Muhammad was establishing uh, the faith of Islam, he didn't know which way to turn to pray. He said, I, must, I, I should turn towards uh, the, the foundation stone, which is at the top of the Mount Zion, which is the Temple Mount, this contested site. And then he changed his mind. He said, no, Mecca is the place. So, so um, the Dome of the Rock uh, is constructed uh, at a moment when Jerusalem has been captured uh, by the Muslim Persian Sassanid Emperor Khosrau. And uh, in 614, uh, he captures uh, Jerusalem. And later, uh, there is the, uh, the important job of marking this place in competition, so here's the theme that we run into throughout this course, in competition with other religions, Christianity, Judaism. And so what do they do? They reproduce with difference. Um, and the big difference, so they copy the Church of the Holy mm -hmm. Sepulchre. Uh, but the difference is uh, seen, again, we see this throughout, but we're going to be more careful to label it. Uh, this is iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is the practice of, uh, 
of refraining from figural representations. So the human form, even animal forms, there is a taboo against that type of representation. So instead, we start with the abstraction of geometric patterns inspired by the Arabic script. Arabic is the root language of Islam, and uh, Islam helps Arabic go from a purely verbal tradition to a written literary tradition very quickly. And it becomes actually, uh, and this is the big theme of the, of the lecture, um, one of the big themes is that Arabic is the language that Western civilization rests upon because uh, the, great, the great works of philosophy and the sciences of the ancient world are preserved because of the veneration of these ancient texts, texts of Islam. The, the scholarship, the tradition of intense obsession with scholarship and the sciences and philosophy of Islam is responsible for carrying forward the Greek, uh, the Greek philosophers are all translated into Arabic by an army of scholars and libraries throughout the Islamic world. And it's via Arabic that is then translated into Latin and comes um, forward into the Italian Renaissance and beyond. And so the linguistic practices of Arabic are imprinted uh, on the architecture in the, in the mode of denotation uh, in, contra in, in avoidance of the figural uh, representation because of the taboo of, uh, of iconoclasm. And so these screen walls are richly decorated. There it is on this stone plaza overlooking Old Jerusalem, uh, gold dome, and rich colors. No one should have any doubt of the superiority of Islam because that's, and that was the task. Um, the dome uh, is exactly 20 meters, well not exactly, but it's more or less 20 meters by 20 meters of a perfect sphere, the same size as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And Islam needs an architecture, and so it says, well, here's an architecture. Here's our competition, the Christian Church of the Holy Sepulchre, this tradition of building baptistry buildings. Um, that's a good one. And so that's what they do. They just copy. They reproduce the baptistry architecture of Christianity with difference. And what a difference it is. The arches become pointed and striped. But the columns are directly out of the Roman, Latin, Christian tradition. Uh, Again, reproduced, but with a difference. And um, the mosaics of the interior uh, are are as or more rich than the exterior, and the the play of light is important. And here's the foundation stone, um, the place from which Muhammad ascends in his dream to the heavens, where the gift of prayer is given to the Muslim people. And there it is, multiple views. Um, after, as I said, the, this is the, um, the Masjid al-Haram. Masjid means place of supplication. And so masjid is the uh, Arab word for uh, mosque. Basically, it translates very directly into mosque. So place of supplication. When we pray in Islam, we have a one meter by two meter mat, the prayer rug that we bring with us. And the, the paving of the floor is marked with paving patterns that indicate the position of the standard size prayer rug. And uh, we, uh, there is a sequence of supplication that involves uh, bending low and placing one's head on the floor. And, uh, one of the five pillars of Islam is the Hajj, the obligation of every uh, Muslim person, if they are financially able, to go on a pilgrimage to the Kaaba, this cube at the center of the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, uh, to circumambulate 
means walk in a circle with the crowd around the Kaaba and perform a prescribed set of prayers. And every year, this is a huge undertaking. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And, um, okay, enough of that. And so here's the setting, and here you can see in the background, let's see if there's another one. So the contestation of this location, here's an artist depiction of the second temple. Um, the first temple is destroyed um, and later rebuilt uh, by Herod uh, in the 5th century BCE. I believe this is the first time in this course I've used the term BCE, is that true? Before the Common Era. This is a terminology that we use to avoid uh, the Christian bias of before Christ, BC. So before the Common Era. Here's the uh, wall of Herod's temple that still remains intact, a big uh, pilgrimage site in Judaism and very tightly contested. Um, here's a rendition of Herod's second, second temple, and a vast complex of buildings um, that were destroyed in uh, the year 70. And um, here's a depiction of the Roman destruction of Herod's second temple and the uh, the spoils are often uh, the financial basis for grand constructions back in Rome and so and when and it's suitable when one uh, pillages a conquered city to take their valuables take it back to Rome build something in this case the Colosseum was financed uh, by the sack of Jerusalem in the year 70, and the uh, it's customary to celebrate the wealth gained from conquest in uh, architecture. So this narrative panel of the Arch of Titus tells the great story of the Roman victory over um, Jerusalem, and there's the menorah. Um, and here's a view we can see, I think it's a high resolution, you can see in the background the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Old Jerusalem and the wall of the Temple Mount. All there. So I'm sorry about that long, didn't mean to have that long uh, caption. But if you look through the caption, you'll see in section the location of the crucifixion of Christ and Christ's tomb uh, that is then uh, pretty much irrecognizably you know, just destroyed, carved out of the rock. So if, you're look, if you go there expecting to see something that looks like the tomb in which Jesus was uh, placed before his uh, resurrection, um, it's, it actually looks like this. Uh, it's inside this container. Um, and this site uh, is very heavily guarded. And so here's the relationship between uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Dome of the Rock. And there it is, um, seen. Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so here is um, the, the, the interesting uh, epilogue to this history is the, in, one, in the year 1009, uh, the Ismaili Fatimid Caliph Abu Ali Mansur al-Hakim, uh, whose mother is Christian, um, but he is the Caliph, the, uh, the Ismaili Muslim Caliph. Ismaili is one of the uh, sects of Islam. Uh, he has this idea <clears throat> that the people of Christianity are being duped by this cult of Pentecostal fire. And the, the Feast of the Pentecost is when the flames, it's, it commemorates the moment when the flame of the Holy Spirit came out of the sky and rested on the foreheads of the faithful. Uh, and he 
in Christianity. We celebrate it every spring. Um, and it was obvious to Al-Hakim that this was cult worship. This is crazy. These poor Christians are being victimized. I must protect them. He intervenes. He closes the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for three years, uh, 1009 to 1012. And over the course of the next uh, several decades, uh, he thinks again. He says, eh, we should probably crack down within Islam, kind of the crazy excesses of within Islam. Um, his, uh, the, the next caliph reopens the church, uh, says, sorry about that, everything's cool. And we go back to the highly tolerant uh, relationship between Islam and other religions on the sacred site. Um, the Muslims are actually uh, use a huge economic uh, boost to all these pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. And so everything's cool. But back in Europe, uh, the church fathers are saying a couple things. We need, we need to have access to our pilgrimage sites. As we'll see on Wednesday, pilgrimage is a big deal in Christianity at this point. Indulgences, remember those? It's a big deal. Um, second, we need something to unify the European, Western, Latin church. Let's do some crusading. And so they said, this is too crazy. We need control of our pilgrimage sites. Look what happened uh, a few decades ago. Uh, and so they rally the troops and they go on their first crusade. And in the year 1099, they conquer, um, they conquer Jerusalem and they turn the Dome of the Rock Church into, I mean, the Dome of the Rock uh, into a church. So unlike uh, Islam, Christianity uh, establishes an absolute no-go zone for Muslims. Um, and this is repeated as we've seen in much of our history. Any questions about that? Okay. So here we are, we're taking another look at North Africa, Saudi Arabia, uh, and we are now going to a place we've been before. We're going to the Iberian Peninsula. Remember the Alhambra in Granada, Spain? How could you forget? It was such a beautiful sight. Um, now we're going nearby. We're going to Cordoba. Cordoba is the location of the center of uh, Moorish Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus is the uh, Muslim name, the Islamic name, the Arabic name for uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And this is where um, the Great Mosque of Cordoba is established. Now this is a fascinating building uh, full of rich readings. I should start by saying, just in case I, so I don't forget, it started as a Roman a Roman settlement, uh, and we'll look at how the Romans uh, conquered and, and rebuilt cities throughout the Mediterranean world. So this was a Roman settlement, and on the site was a temple of Jupiter, uh, one of the Roman gods. And when Rome adopted Christianity, uh, the temple of Jupiter was transformed into a Christian church. And when in, uh, in 711, when the Umayyad uh, Caliph is escaping from uh, the Levant, the, uh, from, uh, from the, the Umayyad Empire, because he's about to get murdered uh, in a contestation of succession, he escapes, he flees, he goes across North Africa. Along the way, he gathers troops. And so these Arabic and African Berber troops uh, he leads them across the Straits of Gibraltar into the Iberian Peninsula and marches uh, northward, reaching as far north as Lyon in France before being uh, repelled by the Franks. And uh, they settle on a boundary uh, just south of the current French, just south of the Pyrenees, the current border between France and Spain. And that is the territory of Al-Andalus. They established their Grand Mosque in Cordoba, and it starts small, um, 
and then expands over the years. And then in 1236, when the reconquest is well underway and Christianity comes back, um, they plop a church and then later a cathedral in the center of the great mosque of Cordoba. So remember back in Mexico and uh, Mexico City and down in Cusco in the Andes, where it's important to knock down the building of the person you're replacing. Well, this is some version of that. They just convert it. It's, it's too valuable a fabric. They convert it um, first into a mosque, and then when the Christians come back, they convert it into a cathedral. So at the heart of this is the mihrab which you will recall is the niche on the Qibla wall. What is Qibla? Qibla is the direction of Mecca. And because we are obligated to face Mecca when we pray, it's important to know which way Mecca is, at least to some of us. Um, other traditions are more loosey-goosey, but if, if you go into a hotel, um, I don't know if this happens in the United States, but increasingly in the United States, I think there's a little green arrow on the ceiling. Have you seen that? No one's seen the green arrow? Yeah? Okay. Not here, but I see it. Where do you see it? I saw it in Antioch. Antioch. Where's that? Southeastern Turkey. Okay, you would see it there. But um, so as you travel, look for the green arrow. There's a Gideon's Bible. It's the Gideon's Bible of the rest of the world. Uh, Gideon's Bible is the thing that's in every hotel in the United States. The rest of the world, there's a green arrow, a sticker on the ceiling, and that points to its Qibla. It's the direction of Mecca. One of the reasons uh, that Muslims are so damn good at math and why they developed mathematics and the sciences so beautifully and so richly, why they gave us uh, some of the great geometric ideas and trigonometry, is because they got to figure out with some degree of precision which way is Mecca. And so they need to know the geometry of the planet in a way that nobody else did in Europe. And so Qibla uh, and the Mihrab uh, is, is a fundamental part of successful Salat prayer towards Mecca. And so we, um, we have the Mirab and the Qibla wall. It's the focus of the prayer. It's the direction we point our, our prayer mats. And we mark and celebrate the Qibla wall in the Mosque of Cordoba with this fantastical interlacing arch, complex arch system and it uses the stripe masonry that we will see in Romanesque architecture, the Christian Roman architecture, but here uh, elaborated with these uh, remarkable geometries of these arches that are marking the mira, they're marking the Qibla wall. And so uh, again, we see the remarkable uh, sophistication of the geometric sciences, uh, in, and then up into the vaulting of the dome, which is another part of marking that crucial moment in in the in the where the mirab is in the in the mosque. And so um, the complex geometry is an internalized thing. The exterior of this mosque, as you saw, is just not that fantastical. It's a very much an interiorized experience. And you see uh, the challenges of connecting the rest of the mosque to this very special uh, construction formation at, at the Mirab. And here's this, uh, this richly decorated interpenetrating vault pattern that we don't see matched until we get um, to the Gothic. Uh, but this very elaborate um, scalloped dome geometry at the central mirab, and you see it here. And this almost Baroque shell-like uh, scoop uh, that is behind the prayer niche of the, of, the, of the mirab. So the interesting thing here is that this is actually uh, enters into the system after 
the hypostyle hall is built. And so the primary element of the mosque is this hypostyle hall. What is a hypostyle hall? It is a grid structure of columns that support a simple roof system that uh, can be expanded in a modular pattern, typically, uh, in multiple directions. And that's exactly what happens. Um, this is not exactly right, but um, it gives us the idea. of It starts out with a courtyard. So the absence of columns shows us that there's no roof. And this shows the rows of columns, which shows that uh, the primary structural direction is this way. And then there's a secondary uh, structural direction um, in that, in the, across it. And so those are, in this case, it's uh, framed with timber beams uh, across the long dimension. And so it goes from this expands in both directions. And the black square is the tower, um, the minaret, the equivalent, the, functionally, the minaret. And then we get, uh, as it expands, that's when we get the mirror, uh, the three domes, and the special vaulting. That until this moment, there is no marking of the hierarchy of the space. Back here, uh, the marking of the space would have been done in a less dramatic way, and it's only in the development when it gets here that we have that we get to the next step of the development of the mosque, which is hey, let's it's time for a mirab, and so that's when that gets developed. It expands again uh, in this direction, and then here we see it with the um, with the cathedral. This, sorry about the orientation, um, but this shows that in a, in a more precise manner that we, uh, we get the expansion in multiple phases over the centuries of Moorish uh, Spain. And you see that location at the top, that's the mirab where, the, where this cursor is. Now the hypostyle hall is... Uh, characterized by these double striped arches where the upper arch is thicker and the lower arch is narrower. There's the timber roof beams that span uh, in the long dimension from one arch uh, line of arches to the next line of arches. And then uh, this elaborate masonry structure where it they're able to achieve a greater height because they have these lower arches performing a bracing function. <clears throat> and here's the effect on the interior. It is experienced as this endless vast forest of columns, especially when you look diagonally through um, the system of the hypostyle hall. And here's... Um, and it actually, uh, it's, it's available to study the, the variation of column spacing, the variation of column types, because it is spolia, it's taken the columns. Spolia means you take the building elements from a former structure and you repurpose them and recycle them and reuse them in a new structure. And so every time one of these expansions occur, it's important to uh, carefully reuse uh, the elements uh, and reconcile them to a single unified geometry more or less. And so that's the, um, the challenge of the expansion of the mosque. And so you see the timber ceiling, or you can't see the timber ceiling, but it rests on the double arches uh, of different thickness on top of the spolia columns with a certain diversity. And the exterior, uh, there's an emphasis on uh, and the, the study has been done of all the different doorways around the mosque. It's quite rich and interesting, the variety of the doors. But you see the kind of door we saw in Zanzibar, the House of Wonders, and you see uh, this characteristic arch of the, um, of the Moorish uh, architecture. And uh, it has this fortress-like quality. Then you see um, in the Reconquista, as the Christians come in, and they build um, the church, first the church and then the cathedral that we see today. Um, but the other thing that happens is <clears throat> during those centuries where the Iberian Peninsula hosts both the Islamic societies in some sections, 
and the Christian societies that have uh, taken over other sections, there is, uh, it allows a rich interplay of cultures because for a large part of this period, there is a toleration. There's even, as we mentioned in the Alhambra lecture, there is a, a alliance, there are alliances between Muslim cities and Christian cities against common enemies. And so it is a much richer uh, culture of exchange during these centuries than the clash of civilizations model of Islam versus the rest of the world would have us believe. And this is, um, I, I mentioned that there was this rich commitment to scholarship that brought us, uh, the Greek philosophers, brought us that literature via the Arabic scholarship of centers like Granada, Cordoba, Sevilla, and Toledo. Uh, but it also gave us some original thinking because these philosophers were not just scribes. They were actually actively debating, as mentioned in the Alhambra lecture, the relationship between the natural world that can be observed by science and the theological uh, understandings of the world as given to us by Allah. And so um, Ibn Rushd, who's known in the West as the philosopher Avaras, uh, was a pioneer of the, uh, the reconciliation of these two worldviews and establishing a fundamental basis of understanding that uh, was then embraced through the, the transfer of knowledge on the Iberian Peninsula during these centuries that then is available uh, for the Italian Renaissance to pick up and develop um, into what we now recognize as Western civilization. And so the, uh, the, the Moorish tower becomes uh, a, a bell tower and the Christian um, uh, version of the cathedral. Here we, we take a look at the spread of Islam out of uh, Mecca and Medina in the seventh century. Um, where they're marching to Isfahan, where we'll be in a second, uh, to Merv, and then subsequently to Samarkand, which was uh, a Muslim society long before the, the Mongols uh, came and destroyed Samarkand uh, so that it could re renew itself as uh, a Timurid um, Islamic society. Here we see this expansion uh, from the Arabian Peninsula, uh, that was unified at the time of Muhammad's death in 632 uh, and spreading out. Now, it, it's easy to believe from this that it was this marauding military project, but um, and it was, but it wasn't just a marauding military project. There was also this um, centuries-long problem of warring tribes uh, of Arabia. And Islam was this cosmopolitan, tolerant, uh, unifying worldview system that was capable of accommodating all these local belief systems and incorporating them in a very syncretic, very self-consciously syncretic act that um, do we have rules of conduct and aesthetic expression and speech? Uh, we have the language of Arabic. Yes, we have all that, but it is also this modern system. It is an urban-based system. And we're going to be looking at examples as we move forward uh, in the next half hour of how Islam as an urban system reinforces uh, the faith of the faithful. And, and you really, it, at the basis of Islam is, you can't really do it on your own. You need a community of support. And that is one of the principles of Islam. And it also... Uh, is accommodating to local cultures. So just as at the Dome of the Rock we see the embrace of the Christian architectural form, all over the world we see the embrace of uh, preceding architectural forms. Um, at some point we're going to look at the Javanese example of how a Hindu Javanese uh, temple is then adapted to become the characteristic Southeast Asian mosque form. Uh, and it's a simple move, and it's not controversial until recently, um, but it's an interesting thing. As we see the spread, 
it also, as we've seen in previous lectures, becomes a, tr a world of trade and exchange. Um, this indicates one of the weaknesses of our mapping. You know, this map maker is very interested in Al Andalus, but they're not so interested in what happens down here. And so we're going to see another map in a few minutes that ignores what's happening north and focuses on what's happening. So this is an incomplete portrayal, is what I'm trying to say. But we see um, this wave um, of this movement. We see um, Cordoba as this Roman settlement. And here we have the mosque of Cordoba on the river. And the bell tower. Um, Charles V, uh, who we've met at the Alhambra, uh, feels that the mosque itself is a much greater achievement uh, than uh, what the Christians have done since. Um, and here's an example of, in Damascus, uh, an interesting demonstration of Christ the toleration of Christian communities under Islam in, right from the start, where we see in Damascus uh, the entry into um, the mosque courtyard and then uh, the Umayyad palace, but also the church right there. And this is um, something we've heard about the Orientalism of uh, the colonial period, where it was useful to depict uh, Islam and its practitioners as these violent barbaric forces. And so there's this rich school of Orientalist painting out of France and elsewhere where uh, the, there's a narrative function, often of decadence and naked boys and uh, harem girls and the decadence of the sultans. But here we see the flag of Islam being raised and this call for, for jihad against the Christians. Uh, did it happen? Sure, but it was not the norm. Um, it's really um, kind of a story uh, that was useful. Quick question. Yes. Um, that painting uh, from the other movies shows natural light penetrating the area, but it's, there is no natural light. There is no natural light. Um, and it's actually difficult to photograph, as you may have noticed. Um, other questions? So, zooming out from Spain over the Mediterranean and North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula once again. And this time we're going to point north. Samarkand is off to the right. Um, we're going to come down in Isfahan. And this, one of the important things to pay attention to here is the specifically Arabic Persian uh, aspect uh, that leaves its mark on Islam. That this becomes, uh, as as Islam is adapted at different uh, places uh, to whatever local culture is operating, it's the Persian variant that becomes remarkably dominant. And we see that in this, um, this Friday mosque. Friday is the holiest day. Friday uh, at noon, you, you get to leave work. Uh, you get to leave work early, you know, and you go at noon to the to the Friday, the Friday Prayers Mosque, the largest mosque in town, and you go there for the sermon. So this is the Friday Mosque. It's also known as the, the Great Mosque. It's the largest mosque at the time. It's also known as Masjid i Jameh. And Jameh, so in Arabic, Masjid, remember, is the place of supplication, the mosque, of Jameh. Jameh is Friday. So it's, it all means the Friday Mosque. So, um, again, we see another example, uh, and since it's a similar story, we can move through it quickly. Pay attention to this line. This is the, the souk. This is the bazaar. This is the shopping street. And you can spot it um, from above because of it forms these lines coming out in relationship to the mosque. You will recognize this as being very similar to Registan Square of Samarkand. No coincidence, they are taking their template from this prior construction in Isfahan. And so this is the model. This is the template that gets transferred to Samarkand. Uh, and you see these 
these densely packed neighborhood of courtyard houses. You can pick out the different houses in this view because each house has a courtyard. Why does each house have a courtyard? Why is this so densely packed? Why is it more densely packed around the mosque and less densely packed as we move away from the mosque? Ah, let's find out. So here's what it looks like. Not so different from uh, Cordoba, we see this hypostyle uh, grid that there are so many different uh, vaulting patterns that if you zoom in, should I zoom in? Let's zoom in, see what happens. So there's a great variety of vaulting patterns that indicates just how um, interesting and diverse I'll stop moving around, sorry about that. Just how interesting and diverse uh, this fabric is. That, uh, and it develops over time. You see these shifts in, in column pattern. You see different sizes, different shapes. Uh, and so all of this is a reflection of this very complex incremental construction process over the course of centuries. And so there is no single builder uh, and it results in this remarkably complex, elaborate uh, system shown here that is legible uh, and has been studied quite extensively. And so we'll break it down into a few phases. One of the first things that happens is all these different hypostyle halls that are developing as Islam becomes uh, more and more popular, uh, and larger and larger congregations need to be accommodated. So the patchwork of different hypostyle uh, grids and structural patterns gets unified by a two-story madrasa facade. Um, and you know what a madrasa is, right? That we saw in Registan Square, what is it? Schools, right. Um, and so again, we see the emphasis on learning and scholarship. And so we see this two-story uh, hall uh, supporting the madrasa functions of the mosque. Then we see um, the absence of the central dome marking the mihrab, and then we see its addition. And I'm sorry, it's, that's south towards Mecca. That's the Qibla direction is south because we're north of the Arabian Peninsula. And so we, we face, we face uh, that side of the courtyard at the top of the slide. And uh, we also see this quite interesting thing of a north dome at it that has been one of the interesting puzzles um, of historians looking at this. You see the specific vaulting uh, technology that there's a way of stacking bricks. Uh, it's not that, um, it's kind of like the innovation that we saw in Brunelleschi's uh, Florence Cathedral dome um, some years later where the brick pattern allows you to lay the bricks without centering, which is the, uh, the wooden formwork upon which a lot of masonry arch, arch work gets placed, that you need something to hold up the bricks while uh, you build it. And then um, after a certain period of curing of the mortar, you can remove the centering. There's a huge advantage to developing innovative brick patterns, as Brunelleschi did, that is to a large extent self-supporting self uh, and you only have to use the, um, the scaffolding to maintain a pattern in the template. So here's um, a sense of some of the variety of domes, but all of them are making, uh, taking advantage of this innovation of uh, self-supporting brickwork. And here's a depiction of the wide variety of domes. They tend to be uh, based on the square and then the rotation of the square of 45 degrees. And so it generates an eight-pointed geometry that where the dome gets reconciled into the orthogonal structural system below. Again, through those squinches. Remember what a squinch is? It's that thing, that very complex, uh, tricky thing that you have to put underneath us a round dome to reconcile the roundness to the square base. Think of it like, how do you get a, a round peg to fit into a square hole? Squinch. You got to squinch it in. And so the squinch is that geometry 
in Islam, the practice is to use the hanging stalactite mukarnas, um, mukarnas uh, hanging stalactite pattern, which is a source of such remarkable richness in uh, Islamic architecture. Uh, where they get a chance to show off their remarkable virtuosity and geometric prowess. Uh, and so the next thing we do is we start to fill in some of the, the gaps. Uh, we connect the dome structure to the surrounding hypostyle. Um, a lot of these things start out at freestanding independent structures. And so we have to, uh, after the fact, figure out how to uh, connect the dome structure to the hypostyle hall. And so we do that. We show it in section here. We, we have the dome, freestanding independent structure. We have the hypostyle hall, which predates the dome. Um, and then we create a vaulting system that weaves it all together. And it manifests on the roof uh, in these masonry structures that are quite interesting in and of themselves, the roofscape. The minarets get added much later um, as because that's the fashion. Um, so we start to see the complex flesh out, but what's going on with these big, what are these things called? We saw at Richestown Square, what was that again? What are they? What are those called? Isn't it on your sheet? Okay, I'll let you think. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go to the North Dome. Something weird happens in the North Dome. The North Dome is a hall uh, for of arbitration, like the Hall of Justice that we saw in Casablanca. We saw it again in the Alhambra. Uh, Islamic law is a big deal uh, and uh, it requires a system of judges. It's a very sophisticated, it's a serious business. So this is the Hall of Justice and the North Dome. But what's going on here? There's a weird thing in the dome pattern. Do you see that? What's going on there? What's up with that? So there's this pentagon. There's this five-pointed star. Five? What's a five-pointed star doing in a fundamentally eight-based system? Well, some believe, and I tend to agree, that this was, I don't remember his name, and he would hate that, that I'm not mentioning his name, but uh, every once in a while you get a caliph who says, listen, I'm special, I want to be remembered, um, and I'm going to do something unprecedented. I'm going to show off my geometric prowess by sticking a five-pointed a five, uh, poly polygonal figure inside what is fundamentally a, an eight, a, a base eight system of geometry. That's how good I am. And so that's what he's doing. So what are those four things called? Ewans. So Ewans are, are of, of an architectural form that predated uh, Islam. It was basically what marked the stage of the throne. So it's this portal, it's this proscenium stage-like structure. And uh, in this case, uh, there's a very interesting one to the north, which is a barrel vault, which leads to the Hall of Justice. Um, but the other three are more standard, more familiar to us from our experience in uh, Samarkand. Um, and very large-scale squinches, I mean, um, mukarnas, uh, geometries. Um, and then the geometry is emulated in the pool. Uh, and we see um, this becomes the crucial expression that we need to have uh, in mosques. Um, to really uh, emulate this, and it's not just a mosque, it's not like a church, it's, uh, it's more akin to the churches with a monastery complex with, uh, and a cloister. This is a complex that has to support all kinds of functions, not just the congregational gatherings on Friday for noon prayers, 
for Friday sermon, uh, but also the school element, the um, the judicial aspect, the, and we saw it in Suleimanye's mosque in Istanbul, uh, where there's the caravanserai, the the hotel function for travelers uh, engaged in trade. Uh, there's the marketplace not far off, and this. Uh, system keeps moving out as we see um, here's an example of um, the particular richness of the mosaic um, practices that are pioneered under the Persian uh, artistry um, at Isfahan. Uh, in the 15th century um, while Samarkand is going through its expansion we see Shah Abbas starting at number two up there, that's the Friday Mosque complex that we've been looking at. In the 15th century, there's this explosive expansion, uh, including this much larger uh, four E1 uh, courtyard that's more directly oriented uh, to Mecca, and it's much larger. There's a royal mosque complex established here, and there's a whole system of urban gardens and a palace, so it, it explodes into this vast system centered on the royal, the, uh, another 4E1 system of the Royal Mosque Complex. Um, and here's uh, a picture of that expansion. And so I mentioned that the system keeps moving out, that uh, a key component of Islam is that it is fundamentally urban. You'll notice that while other world religions maintain a seasonal calendar where it reflects the uh, false, the pattern of fall, summer, uh, whatever you know, the four seasons, the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, and every year the fasting month of Ramadan, which by the way is pillar number three, you must uh, refrain from eating during daylight hours during the month of Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan shifts by 10 days every year because it is a lunar calendar of 355 days. And so uh, who does that? Well, not farmers. If you're an agricultural society, you got to stick with what works in terms of the patterns of harvest and planting and all of that. Uh, so Islam is an urban-based uh, culture. Uh, it requires us to live amongst the true believers of the faith. When I went to Sumatra after the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami and helped to rebuild the towns along the coastline uh, where 85% of the population was killed, you couldn't just rebuild where they were. You have to now relocate their houses next to the mosque. You can't live wherever you want. That would create a mosaic where only 15% of the lots were occupied. And so we actually, one of the hardest things we had to do was to relocate people next to the mosque in Banda Aceh, in Sumatra. The veil, uh, the modesty, the requirement of modesty for women covering the head uh, so that men are not stimulated by desire. Uh, thank you, women, uh, for helping me go, be a good Muslim. Uh, and so there's the veiling. And there's an architectural veiling of the household. There's a taboo of windows that might permit me to look in to the house. There's a taboo of rooftop, uh, looking from one rooftop to another. Uh, one of the most brutal chapters in uh, the Iraq war was Fallujah, where the US military set up a rooftop uh, observation post. And Fallujah was arguably the most stable, peaceful town in the occupation in the early days. But it was this direct and dramatic uh, violation of Muslim law that caused a protest. And so as they were peacefully marching down the street, shots rang out and you know, it ensued in months and then years of some of the most bloody, violent. Uh, Fallujah became the center of the Iraq war. Uh, after that, but it's basically because of the um, this hijab architecture that I'm referring to not being uh, respected. Uh, there are practices by which uh, streets can be covered over, uh, the expansion of households, 
the architecture of the household expands in a close parallel to what's happening in the mosque complexes with this central courtyard and this proliferation of other uh, spaces around it. In some cases, quite elaborate households with their own uh, sign of prestige in this uh, Mukarnas uh, articulation of a domed space. Uh, in this case, double story. Um, quite elaborate. Uh, the souk marketplace, we saw it in the rooftop view. And uh, these great shopping streets that still exist. The Caravanserai trade network across the Levant, the Muslim trading world, um, that we'll look at more. Uh, and the obligation of, of a good Muslim to uh, provide guest accommodations um, is also one of the supportive things. So are there any questions about Isfahan and this Uma? I didn't say what an Uma was, right? Uma is the community of the faithful. And in order for us to be good Muslims, we need to be in the context of the Uma. The Uma is not just a social context, but it is one of these things we keep running into. It is a formal, spatial, institutional arrangement that supports, it becomes the infrastructure of Islam, of being faithful. It's, does that happen in other religions? Of course it does. You need to go to church on Sunday, you need to go to temple. Um, but in Islam, it plays a remarkably fundamental role. Uh, it's, it's an obligation. And so Islam, this supports the uh, claim that I'm making that Islam is the most urban and architecturally uh, grounded um, faith of the world faiths. Any questions? Okay. Just a few minutes left. Now we're going back to across the Sahara Desert. We are going to Timbuktu on the shores of the Niger River, which comes out of Nigeria. And it flows up here. It flows from here uh, across the southern Sahel uh, area just below the Saharan uh, Desert. And it's at this bend of the Niger River. Uh, and it's this ancient city that uh, forms uh, from the 8th century on. Uh, it becomes important because of salt. <clears throat> What's the big deal about salt? <clears throat> well, as we become agricultural, uh, we need to supplement our diets with salt. If we are hunters and gatherers, we get salt uh, through uh, the hunting part, through the animals we kill. But an agricultural-based society needs salt. Where do you get salt? Well, you can evaporate it out of salt water, but it's much easier to get if you can find uh, geological deposits of salt and you can mine it out. And so you have the salt mines of the Mali Kingdom becoming uh, a huge source of wealth because you can trade salt for gold. South of Timbuktu uh, are the gold fields of the Benin and Ghana empires uh, and this great trade of salt and gold and while we're at it let's add ivory to the mix and slaves and this trade becomes extremely uh, uh, is the basis of a great prosperity of Timbuktu because this is, it is at the junction where the canoe of the Niger River meets the camel of the caravanserai. And so the camel, which is this miraculous animal that permits uh, trade across the desert, um, uh, they can go, as I mentioned previously, nine days without water. They can carry twice as much as an ox. And uh, uh, they don't breed very much on their own. And so the innovation of artificial insemination of camels allows uh, this domesticated fleet of camels for uh, creating this network of trade across the Saharan Desert. Um, and you get at the junction this flourishing of Islam because of the uh, Muslim Almoravids uh, and then the Almohads, the Berber traders from the north come down and they conquer Ghana, the gold fields of Ghana, and they leave in its place this Islamic civilization, 
and the, the kingdom of Mali. And uh, the, the first Muslim king of Mali um, to go on a hajj, remember you must go on hajj, is Mansa Uli. Mansa means uh, king. And so Mansa Uli goes on hajj uh, and establishes this practice. And um, in 1324, Mansa Musa, the filthy rich king of Mali, goes on Hajj, and this kingdom registers on the consciousness of the rest of the world because of the amazing wealth that he takes with him. Uh, and when he comes back, he brings an architect from uh, the Alhambra, and he says, hey, I want a mosque like those sophisticated, urbanized Muslims of the rest of the world. I'm rich enough. I need a sophisticated mosque. Well, brilliantly, Islam adapts to the local practices of mud-based architecture, and they create these remarkable mosques. In 1327, uh, the Jingara Bear Mosque of Timbuktu is the central focus, but we could just as easily look at uh, several other mosques that are similar. What are these wooden posts for? Well, let's, let's see. Um, they still have the vaulting system, but now it's this, uh, this woven of organic materials covered with mud, and then another layer uh, to create these vaulted spaces. Again, we see the door technologies that we saw in, in the expression that we saw in Zanzibar, the House of Wonders. So Timbuktu is at the center of this trade network of these other cities. Um, it has this port on the Niger River, uh, Kabara, and Jene is a totally independent kingdom uh, that also emulates the success of Timbuktu. And you get these vast caravanserai trade routes that really connect it to the rest of the world. Uh, and here you see the dotted line of Mansa Musa's uh, Hajj, uh, first to Cairo and then to Mecca. In Cairo, his gold that he is not just spending a lot of it, he's giving it away. He gives away so much gold that it collapses the gold prices in Cairo. Here's the intersection that still occurs today. This is in Kabara, but it's a similar port where these small boats meet the caravanserai. Now it's um, road trade. And um, Mansa Musa gets an awful lot wrong, and he's corrected and they help him out and they say, no, you can't have naked women running around. No, uh, you can't have concubines. Uh, uh, you have to marry and have official wives. Uh, and he says, oh, I didn't know. Sorry about that. He also embraces scholarship. Uh, so it's architecture and scholarship. And Timbuktu becomes um, the location of one of the great libraries of Muslim literature. Uh, and Muslim law, and to, this, to the present day. Um, the other mosques, the mud, uh, so just these last points of, it comes out of the adaptation of Islam to the local practice of mud house structures, where every element on this house that you can see has a symbolic character to it. Uh, you can tell this household, they had five children, uh, that they got married in this year, that people died in this year, um, they went on Hajj. And so all of this is embedded in the symbol system of the facade. Uh, and it goes on continuously to the present day. Every building in this society has to be renewed annually because of the mud plaster brick. So there's this very strong anthropomorphic nature to the architecture. It also, if it loses its significance to the people, it goes away. If it is important to the people, it gets renewed. So it's a very dynamic, uh, quickly evolving tradition. Uh, and then we see the final example of the Jene Mosque, uh, which uh, the current version was built in 1907 by the French, um, but it, it reflects the practices of the previous centuries of mosque architecture. This is what those uh, sticks are for. It's for the annual um, resurfacing of the mosque. So, any questions about that or anything? Okay, Chris, yes? 
Why not stones? Actually, great question. Part of the Jingera Bray Mosque is stone, but um, the local building practices were really were this. This is the technology we understand. This is the technology we're comfortable with. We wouldn't even think of building it in something else. We don't have a lot of wood, uh, and so we're really limited by the environment of the materials that it offers and by our comfort level and our knowledge of other technologies. So it's not. And Islam says, cool, well, it works for you. And the more universal, the majority attitude of Islam is whatever works. Other questions? 